world's most notorious high secure psychiatric hospital, home to some of the country's most infamous offenders. For the first time, and after years of negotiation, Broadmoor has allowed our cameras in to meet its patients and show what really goes on behind these walls. Um, that gives you four there, please, over. I shudder at a lot of the things that I've done in life and, and the bad mistakes and opportunities that I've missed. For a second, I just remember bam, hearing bam, and, and my finger pulling the trigger. It's the worst, worst experience I've ever had. Baltimore's actually been my lifeline because obviously, you know, when I was in prison, I've given six months to live, and I'm here 13 years later. I thought, oh no. <laughs> I'm going to the funny farm. I said, oh no, mate. I knew I was coming here. I had a feeling I was coming here. Men are sent to Broadmoor because they are suffering from serious mental disorders and many have committed violent crimes. They are considered too dangerous to be treated anywhere else. Many think that Broadmoor is simply the dumping ground for society's most notorious criminals, a final destination with no hope of return. Shall we move on? He's here because of the attempted murder of his mother, not terribly bright. A weekly ward meeting gives a summary of the kind of men who are kept here. The last thing he did um, was he took his MP3 player and took bits of it, uh, took the wire from it and a, a ring, a metal ring from it and tied it around his genitalia. And he did that in the middle of the night and it was only when he was in real pain that he managed to tell the member of staff. And it's not really clear why he did it. Jailed? Good man. In prison, it became clear that there was something wrong with this guy. Broadmoor is home to 200 men, each carefully assigned to one of 15 wards, depending on their mental state. Oh, what's there to say about him? He's 33, index offence of murder. He's got extreme kind of borderline personality disorder, antisocial personality disorder. He's in this hospital because in a medium secure unit, he sharpened the handle of a toothbrush and tried to stab a member of staff in the face. Patients' identities have been protected at the hospital's request. Cranfield is the intensive care ward for the hospital's most acutely mentally ill patients. The men here are unpredictable and violent, and the simple act of serving meals has to be carefully tailored to the individual. You all right? Chicken wrap? Yeah. Don't turn him. No, no Give us a chance. Yeah, food is here. Chicken schnitzel. Thank you. I didn't throw it. What? I didn't throw it. Three days on the trot. <laughs> Thank you. One of the biggest misconceptions, I think, is that those that have severe mental illnesses or those that end up in a place like Broadmoor are kind of destined to, to, to be unwell forever or to be risky forever, and that simply isn't true. The mental disorders that we treat are very amenable to treatment. It's hard to believe that men, locked up like caged tigers and only ever allowed out one by one, can ever progress but each ward in Broadmoor is a staging post to their recovery. Three breakfast, mate. Breakfast time on Epsom, a high dependency ward. The risk here is a little lower. That's hot, that is, mate. Have you your meds yet? Oh, well, they'll be coming in a minute. All right. All right, mate. Patients here are allowed out to associate with each other, with plenty of staff and attendants. You should get out, man. Well, I want to see. Yeah. Is he coming out? Come out. Is he coming out? Yeah, come out. Yeah. Come out, yeah. Yeah. Right. Tell me what you want Pull to do. Pull your trousers up. Pull your trousers up, yeah. You need to wear trousers like Simon Cole, up to the waist. <laughs> Belted. When did you last clean your rooms? Leanne McGee is the hospital's director. 
Whenever she can, she comes back to the floor. I love being on the wards. I love seeing the patients. I'm a nurse. You never lose the... This is where you want to be, really. You just have butter in the end. Just butter. Yeah. And your day goes much quicker. It's better spending it with people that you're being paid to look after than sitting at a desk. You know, which sometimes seems somewhat meaningless. But there we are. Mm -hmm. Right, I hope that's uh, OK, Trevor. Yeah, fine. We're coming to breakfast, mate. I think there's a difference between being mentally ill and not being mentally ill. And I think if you're mentally ill and you've done something that perhaps you are not in full control of at the time, you certainly, society owes you a break. And I think everybody deserves to have a bit of hope. If you have no hope, you're just going to give up. OK, enjoy. Yeah, I have a coffee. Leave yeah. Italiano. Italiano. Can I be rude and ask how old you are? I'm 40 years old. 40? Yeah. All together, I've done 20 years. 15 years here and five years in prison. Long time, isn't it? I was a, I was a child soldier. And it's called Somalia, Somali land. Where are you? Yeah, when I was young. I had my first AK at the age of nine years old. You know, so... Is that AK-47? AK-47, AK yeah. Is that a machine gun? No, it's, it's AK-47. Is it like a rifle? Yeah, it's not yeah. a rifle, it's like a... It's, like, it's a gun, you've never seen AK-47. No. You've never seen AK-47. He's well on the way to uh, be referred to a certain rehab. Oh, good, yeah. good. He's doing really well. Once the risk of violence to themselves or others has been reduced, a patient can move to the greater freedom of an assertive rehab ward. We all have keys for our own room. Uh, so, I forgot a override key. Adam has been on Canterbury Ward for the past four years. Before that, he spent nine years in Broadmoor in a high dependency ward. The rooms are quite small, um, about six foot by three foot, and you can actually just about touch wall to wall. Toilet in there, toilet and hand basin. The only problem with having the toilet in there is we've also got our wardrobe in there. Convicted of arson, he was seven years into a life sentence in prison when his self-harm became so acute he was moved to Broadmoor. I had a very long history of self-harm, but when I was in the prison service, it escalated to the point where I was putting my life on the line on a daily basis. I was cutting arteries, tendons, but it's like my hand. It's totally constrained and backwards because I've got a wound here where I cut all the tendons and that. Yeah. Thank you, love. It's not mine, it's, it's my, my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I had a very traumatic childhood. The way I felt is that my parents didn't love me as much as they should have. I was sexually abused by Sarah's people outside the family. And because of the sexual abuse, self-harm started taking place when I was about eight years old. Um, I started off with nails and things like that. Um, and I also started setting fires at that age as well. I just sort of grew up hating everybody, hating society, hating life. Self-harm was a way of me escaping all that. Adam's Broadmoor journey has been long with many setbacks, but the end is finally in sight. He's to be allowed out on trial leave to a medium secure unit 30 miles away. Here comes the boss. All is well. The constant toing and froing of patients on this ward can make you forget you're in Broadmoor. Yeah. 
but there's always the reminder that this is a high secure facility for men capable of violence. When patients take it in turns to cook, careful account has to be kept of everyday household items, especially of those that could be used as weapons. Dylan is 49. It's his second time in Broadmoor. This is how Dylan remembers his childhood. I got born into a satanic family, very, very violent. Um, in some cases, it would have been better to have killed me than to allow me to have this abominable life that I've had. You know? um, my father, thankfully, he died homeless alcoholic, so he, he was the bone breaker. You know, he would break my bones and leave me in the attic and just, that'd be it, do you know what I mean? So I had to learn pain very quickly. Yeah, do you watch that um, death row thing? I did watch this week. My father raped and beat my mother badly. In his twisted thinking, he could raise a demon from some kind of hell by raping her in the way that he did. The um, moment I was born, she freaked out. She said, oh, your eyes are evil, you're evil. And that was it. She just tried killing me. She made me cat's food all the time. She was keeping me locked up in the attic. Wasn't allowed to talk to my brothers or my sister. And my mother, she also liked the sexual abuse. Yeah, she was adamant that every single avenue of my childhood was going to be destroyed. And she done her best for that. Can I have a plastic spoon, please? I was pretty thin. I had to steal my food. It was fire that got me away from the home eventually. By the time I reached five and six, I'd learnt the red match strike on the wall like my mother did to light the gas oven. So I took a handful of them to school for the first time I was allowed to go to um, kindergarten and I could smell the box of food, you know, and the sandwiches and all that, you know. So I scoffed my face really big, big, big time and then set fire to it. No, I should go for a sift, man, no. Dylan was in care from the age of 7 to 18. As an adult, he became a homeless alcoholic. I became an arsonist, there was a violent offender, lots of drug abuse and alcohol. Yeah, unfortunately, I've done some kidnapping. A really nice couple of people, you know, have never done any harm to me. It's very, very drunk, a bottle of vodka, threatened the police outside. I had the guns on me if I didn't put the, the knife down. I basically wanted them to kill me. You know, I wanted them to kill that wild, out of control alcoholic inside me. And I, I was inviting them to do that. And they, uh, you know, they were very, very bloody close. And I just put the knife down. Call it red. It smells nice. Beautiful. I may say so myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyone think I've cooked it? Yeah. <laughs> Everyone else is like Dylan's psychiatrist is currently assessing whether he's sufficiently recovered for release from Broadmoor. Can I just say, can we all wish a very happy birthday? But he's reached 34 today. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Happy to <laughs> Moving on from Broadmoor is a slow process. Birthdays come and go with no set date for release. Broadmoor has 800 staff. Many have been here for years, despite the daily risk of assault. It may be a hospital, but staff here have to have specialised training and equipment to deal with anything, from enforcing medication to managing four-scale riots. It's unusual training for nursing staff. Fuck off! Fuck off! Fuck off! Fuck off! 
This team is deployed around 30 times a year, administering medication and disarming patients with weapons. Not everyone in Broadmoor is directly violent, but their behavior can nonetheless cause grave risk to others. Anthony has been on an admissions ward for five months. He's at the start of his Broadmoor journey. Is that your normal reading? Well, we're forced to read out of the son of the male. But no, probably I wouldn't choose it. <laughs> it's arson that has led to Anthony's incarceration in Broadmoor. His mental health began to deteriorate at university. When I was 19, I started eating quite large amounts of cannabis resin. Um, started eating it? Yeah. I had a glimpse of what I thought on cannabis were things that could solve problems for the whole of the world. I became very grandiose. I believe that the sum of the total energy in the universe was God, and therefore you were God, and I'm God, and this bed is effectively God. And then uh, doing just a bizarre and unusual things like climbing bridges and surfing on trains, and taking back to hospital because I drove past a, a police car when I'd been high. So, but when you say you drove past a police car, what's wrong with that? On the pavement. Ah. Anyway, during that period, somebody broke into my flat and kicked the door down and threatened me in my flat. Um, and the door wiped me in the face after I'd been banging and making music on the window, so I'd been uh, a bit of a, a nuisance neighbour. Uh, but uh, I didn't have a mobile phone. After he left, I barricaded the door and lit a fire in my window to try and get help. Sent to a medium secure psychiatric unit, he again became psychotic and started a fire there. This brought him to Broadmoor. He's previously been on preventative antipsychotic medication, and now his psychiatrist wants him back on it. My introduction to the mental health system was a jab full of a medication that when you wake up, you just you know, feel absolutely terrible, you can't function, you can't communicate, you can't do anything, and it effectively makes me mentally disabled. Anthony is refusing to go back on medication. My doctor, he's saying I'm well at the moment, however, and he was sort of pointing out that the MOJ and probably the public in general will not accept me in the community off medication. So he's saying that if I, if, if I don't get medicated, I'm, I may never get out. Many of the patients here have a history of substance abuse often linked to their mental illness. Therapy aims to give them the skills to resist temptation. So what we want to do is expose people to some substances today, yeah. OK? Yeah. <laughs> is it the real stuff, though? Some of it is real, some of it isn't, so... The whole... 31-year-old Michael is suffering from paranoid schizophrenia. He hears voices. When I first started hearing this stuff, now I was about 24, it was amazing, I couldn't believe it. I had to run out of the house because I was scared. I mean, something's speaking to your head. That's, you know, unheard of to me, do you understand? It might, it might have been drug-induced because I was smoking cannabis heavily at the moment, but it goes more deeper than that. It smells real. Is there a face associated with the voice for you? No, nah, no, nah, just something like in my head. Nothing, nothing. It's like a living... Part in my head is like a, like a demonic kind of being, you understand? But now while you're talking to me, has it been talking? Well, it just called me a fool at this moment that you just mentioned it, but while I was talking, it wasn't saying nothing. But then I mentioned it, I came to think of it, and it just called me, um, yeah. I know it's hard to believe unless you live with it, but it's just, it's just like having a conscious being in your head. Learn to live with it. I'll take the suitcase back to my room. And do what? <laughs> Just do nothing. Do nothing. Yeah. Stay away from drugs, right? It's not good. While medication has diminished Michael's voices, it hasn't eradicated them. How confident are you not to use? Eight. An eight? Yeah. Okay. Obviously, I would like to be at the, at the top end of this car. Mukhtar has been in Broadmoor for two years. It's been the most stable period of his life so far. I've never seen my mum. 
never seen my mom, you know. She's um, supposed to be in America. No. You've never seen her your whole I've life? I've never seen her my whole life. I've tried to find her, but um, that's the difficult part, because I don't even know her full name. Mukhtar ran away from foster care when he was 16 and became involved in street gangs and started selling drugs. He didn't realise he was also becoming mentally ill. I've had a lot of stress. I've had a lot of stress. I kept on hearing voices and I kept on attacking people and I kept on being erratic behaviour. A rival gang warned him off their territory. Mukhtar says his drug supplier gave him a gun and told him to deal with them. Holding a weapon, my first time, and, and he felt like, that like, whoa. To some extent, it did feel like, you know, that I'm dangerous now. But on the other hand, it felt like I'm vulnerable as well, you know? Armed with a gun, Mukhtar returned to the estate. And my intentions were going to fire a gun in the air. I would certainly run off. But these people didn't run off. They chased me to the block of flats. Now I'm cornered. They attacked me, hitting me with knuckle dusters. One of them got the gun like that and pulled it like, to try and take it off my hand. I was scared. I was thinking I'm going to get killed here. So as he grabbed the gun and he pulled it away from me, I just remember Bam, here and bam, and, and my finger pulling the trigger. And um, it's the worst, worst experience I've ever had. How old were you? I was just turned 18, January. Just turned 18. Found guilty of manslaughter, Mukhtar was sent to Broadmoor under a hospital order. I didn't know the place, I didn't know nothing about it. I was being told about medication and everything that I'm going to take. I said, I don't need medication. After my first dose, I understood that my voice started to reduce in intensity. And that's when I realised that, look, something is happening now. No? It was, it was a different, it was different. Mukhtar is focusing on his recovery and hopes to go to university someday. Listen, it was a long time ago and I can't even remember how I came to the streets. But I remember the older shouting out when I switched on the other kids. He's ruthless, he's devilish, he's a born killer. If I knew what I know now, I wouldn't be ruthless, I wouldn't be a sinner. Forget that, I'll be a born winner. I got locked up at a young age. It was due to a mistake that I made, but all is not lost, cause I'm here now. I'm gonna rise above the clouds. I'm gonna, what is my dream? I dream of reality, so why are you mad at me? I'm just trying to be reunited with my family. Like everything in Broadmoor, getting in and out takes time and follows a strict protocol. Alpha, that's all saved. You're clear to move. Hiya. Escorted Hiya. by nurses, Adam has been out to visit the medium secure unit he's hoping to move to within the next couple of weeks. Oh, the person whose bed I'm waiting for, who should have had their MOJ permission, hasn't got it, and everything's changed and everything gone tips up, so there's going to be no movement for at least two to three months. So. Adam's been here for 13 years. He thought he was leaving in a week. Now it could be months. Yes, uh, thank you, November 5th. You're clear to move to Colston, It's a big disappointment. Thank you. Hello, stranger.
Yeah. Yes, you, you're back tonight. Oh, yeah. I was told you went back until the 12th. Really? Who was he? Yeah, it wasn't a very good day. More I did, the more depressed I got. And I, in the end, I came in here, and then I just ended up screaming, shouting, crying. So I started throwing things at my door way to say, look, get in here now, because I'm just about to do something. But I'm still screaming and shouting, quite hysterical. Normally when I throw things, I get up, pick the bits up and do something with them. You know, and I didn't at this time, so that's another thing that shows how far I come. Oh, you mean you use the bits to hurt yeah. yourself? Not a normal thing to do 40-year-old fairy things about, but I had to do what I needed to do to get my head out of that situation, you know, to show that I was in pain and angry and stuff like that, wasn't But you didn't self-harm? I didn't self-harm that time, which I got a lot of praise for. If Adam does self-harm, he'll jeopardise his chances of transfer out of Broadmoor. In Broadmoor, staff rely on knowing their patients well enough to be aware of what's going on in their heads. They call it relational security. This patient right. believes the hospital is trying to poison him. Hi. Hello. How are you? I was going to ask you the same question. I'm very well. <laughs> just, just to kick off, there are several staff that I can smell a bad odor coming from when they hand me something. So can they use gloves, basically? That's what I'm saying. Depending what it is. Well, anything. No. If it's, if it's food <laughs> stuff, no, that's fine. But no, they're not going to be wearing gloves. <laughs> Scrooge. What else is on your list? Towel. They get my flowers. I must get smell. I need a lot. I don't know what to say to that. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest with you, I've had enough of these places. Like you've had enough. Okay, so maybe we'll go back to. Every single day, seeing doing the same thing, seeing the same people, day in, day out. It's just madness. Mm. The thing is, whilst we're here, all they ever talk about is RSU, RSU, RSU. Every single second, every single minute, every single hour, day, year, year out. The way out of Broadmoor is usually along a winding road that eventually leads to a regional secure unit, or RSU. They're found in towns up and down the country. And whilst you do get an RSU, all they'll talk about is, listen, you carry on the way you are, you go straight to Broadmoor. So then they're threatening with Broadmoor. Then you come back to Broadmoor, oh, oh, if you can't be in yourself, you're doing well. You're going to go off you soon. Simon has been moving between high and medium dependency wards within Broadmoor for some years. Well, are we saying something about the difficulty of being here? I'm just scorn. I'm going to scorn if they piss me off on the RFC. Because last time they really pissed me off and I had to knock out some of them. I made weapons as well. I went in the office, yeah, I closed the door behind me. I blocked it with, with, with filing cabinets, the door, and I just trashed the office. And I enjoyed what I did, so I enjoyed it. That's one of the reasons why I'm here, by the way. How are you? I don't know what to say, um, you know what? I don't know what they've been laughing all day. I don't know what the guy's laughing about. Uh, I, I do find it irritating at the moment. Uh, laughing about. It's rude. There's nothing funny about that, do you understand? It's still really rude, man. Come and behave yourself, man. There's laughter and there's inappropriate laughter. Yeah. Right? If somebody's uh, sharing some serious things, they might think you're laughing at them. You know what I mean? That's paranoia. You just gotta be mindful of that. <laughs> A few weeks later, Simon attacked a nurse on his medium dependency ward. He's due to return to high dependency. It's a step backwards. So he's been here before, you know him? Yeah, it's his third time back, yeah. But he likes it on here. He likes the staff and he likes the structure, so that's why he wants to come back. So some days when he wakes up, he'll say, he'll say that I'm Turkish today. And then the next day he'll be Greek. <laughs> so he's quite funny. But yeah, no, you can have a laugh at him, which is good. He is one of the funnier ones of the crew. You all right? Let me get on 
They're collecting Simon from the seclusion area in Chepstow Ward, where he's been kept since the incident. Get yourself ready, you come with me and drive. He's threatened to attack more staff and needs the restrictive regime of a high dependency ward. Job, job then. Shake a leg, mate, come on. He's got his back to the door, is yeah. it? Back to the door. That's it. Hands behind your back, mate. Well done. Come round back, though. Come back, though. Right. Right. You put your trainers on. It's a walk through ten locked doors to move him to another ward in the same building. We don't like to see anybody coming back, but it, it's, it's a quick fix. I mean, we're getting back into the structure, um, restart him on his medication, get him stabilised again, then, then I'm, I'm hoping that he will only be back here for a matter of weeks and then we'll progress him back to Chepstow and that'll be his pathway route out of Broadmoor. Isn't it dangerous wearing a tie? No, it's a clip-on tie. So, uh, anti-strangle. Not a load later. For many of Broadmoor's patients, there's stability to be found in the strict routine of an institution. It may also be the first time they've been looked after, had regular meals, and consistent interaction with others. It's easy to be bad. There's no rules to be bad. But there are a billion rules to be good. But I'm learning. I'm learning. Dylan was a homeless alcoholic for years and ended up living in a forest, foraging for food. That was lovely. He's been on an assertive rehab ward for four years. He's hoping his psychiatrist will let him move on. I do believe that you, you continue to need treatment yeah. in hospital. Yeah. Okay. In that respect, um, my view is that you still have a mental disorder, yeah. um, you know, personality disorder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The thing is that the team, yeah. we do not believe that you need to continue this treatment in uh, high security. I'm still cautious. I think I still believe that you need treatment in conditions yeah, of security. I, yeah. Anything else then? Uh, no, I'm, I, I'm, I'm really just keeping it. Keeping it. I'm getting old now, you know. I, I haven't got time for this. So what do you mean by old? <laughs> getting old. Anybody who's younger I, than me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Say so goes, I'm not the only gay in the village. Um, I know who I am. I know what I've done in the past. You know, I'm a 40-year-old gay man living in a psychiatric hospital. People can't accept that for what I am, and that's their problem. That's not mine. You know, um, I just try and make lemonade out of lemon. Best situation out of a bad situation. <laughs> you know. Adam's still waiting for a date for his transfer to a medium secure unit. Hello! What time is it, Tommy? The time is uh, 25 minutes past two. 25 past four? Two. 22 past four? What's the time? 25 minutes past two. 25 past four? Two. All right, if you see, if you, say, if you say so. If it came between you leaving and you taking medication, what would you do? Well, you then force medication on it. What, me personally? Or, the team. or just as a team? Downstairs and still stuck on the admissions ward, 
Anthony continues to question his need for medication. We want to make sure that the person that we're giving medication to needs it. You're right. No, I'm just doing the checks, OK? No, no big question. On the, at the moment, I've got capacity to make decisions, yeah. apparently, according mm -hmm. to the doctor. Do you think that mental health patients should be able to, while they're well, choose a treatment? I think one of the biggest cruelties of mental health conditions like psychosis is that often the first thing that will disappear is that understanding that your own behaviour and your own thoughts are actually being impacted upon by your mental health. If you say that a risk to the public... And without that insight, it is very, very difficult to persuade anyone that they need treatment. So if you can imagine yourself in a situation where somebody is telling you that you're unwell, although you don't think so, and then they're trying to persuade you to have a medication that might make you sedated or it might make you put on weight, that's not an easy conversation to have with somebody. We don't force injections on people just because we haven't got anything else to do that day. Sure. There's no, lots of other, no, but there's lots of other things that we look in, just like you do. But you agree that medication is forced on some patients just as a prophylactic, just to stop them becoming well in the I'm future? I'm not agreeing to that side of it. But it's... I'm not agreeing to Would you to say that, that doesn't happen? I, I am saying there are times when we have to give people medication because they've become a risk to themselves yeah, or others. Yeah, so what's... So say and because their mental health is, is deteriorated, but I'm not discussing other patients, but discussing no, okay, you. Say, say, Can you walk say, with me so I can yeah, do say, and make sure I'm everyone well. else is OK? I'm well. Adam's got the news he's been waiting for. His bed in the medium secure unit is finally available. I don't want to let my family down. I don't want to let myself down. I don't want to let other people down in here. I'm glad he's going and it's nice for him to be going. In a way, it's a bit sad as well because, like, we've been on the same water for nearly four years, so. It'd be missed, but he won't be to it stood by me for the fucking thing, really, on the board. I, mean, I had my own problems on the board and that. He stood by me and helped me out and did a lot of things for me and looked after me, and, you know. And I try to look after him, but... He just drove me mad with CDs. Uh, <laughs> no, not that bad, but... It's his final evening and time for a last movie with his mate. It isn't for the Lopez, it isn't a lot of films lately. Do you have to stay um, outside in the corridor? Unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> I will miss this place. It's been my home for nearly 40 years. I know people don't like us calling it home, but it is home. Do I close my door? Anthony's condition had been stable, but a few days ago he was forcibly medicated following an incident on the ward when he refused to return to his room and threw himself on the floor, singing prayers. Best thing is if we start off with your perspective on things. His brother and his solicitor are attending a meeting to discuss his care. And yes, I was singing and I was argumentative, ended up in the seclusion room then stripped forcefully um, and then medicated. I slept for um, two nights and, and all those symptoms have gone. I think that's worth noting. Okay, so you recognise you were psychotic for a period of time? Um, yes. Yeah. The conclusion that we have arrived at is that it would be appropriate for you to have prophylactic antipsychotics. Is it um, best practice according to that I'm involved within this decision-making process? I think your views about medication are very well known to the team. 
Why do you believe that I am so anti anti psychotic medication? Well, I know that you experience it to be uncomfortable, but uncomfortable. Uh, it's it is torment. It's uh, it's. Uh, the, the, the debilitating effect of not being able to communicate, to be able to have internal anguish and uh, frustrations and uh, no longer be able to converse with the people that you love and you lose all your friendships, you become isolated you can, and then you've got the, 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 the physical side effects. You don't want to look good. Your hair, your hair goes flat and greasy. Your skin gets away for you. You put on weight. You get starey eyes. Everybody knows you're on medication, and uh, to sum it up as discomfort, I think is a little bit um, maybe not, not. I know that you are distressed by the, the thought of medication. Mm -hmm. Everyone can hear that, but the the trouble is we have a bit of a knack of spending so much time on that that we lose time to help you with other things. And we need, whilst hearing what you want to say about that, because it's important, not having that be the only thing we ever talk with you about. His lack of cooperation is likely to prolong his time in Broadmoor. After a second psychotic episode, Anthony started taking medication. He's been allowed to move to an assertive rehab ward. Following his psychiatrist's recommendation that he be kept in less secure conditions, Dylan is going to a mental health tribunal to see if they will agree. I have totally outgrown being in Baltimore. OK, I've done my medication, I've done my five groups, I've done everything. Let's see the next stage now, you know, give me a little bit of hope. Oh, you know, so, because I'm a one-man band, I don't have family outside or nothing. So if I give up, that's it, it's, no one's going to pick me up and say, well, look, come on. Unusually, the tribunal is over quickly and with everyone in agreement. Well, um, I don't go in there expecting anything, but I've been allowed to uh, be conditionally discharged to an um, MSU. And I'm leaving 10 times better person than I ever have been. And that, my friend, is something all those people that have done bad things to me in their past will never see. Because I've broken the chain. Or more served its purpose. <laughs> I don't need you now, more, more, more. <laughs> Adam is finally leaving Broadmoor, and Leanne, the hospital's director, has come to say goodbye. Goodbye, good luck. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. All the best. Go. And you. Okay? Yeah. Don't come back. Oh, wait. Okay. All right, then. Cheers. Bye, Leah. Bye, Leah. That's nice where to come down. Don't get too stressed out. Don't let this place drag you down. Right, excuse me. Yeah. See you later, all right? Yeah, take care. Good luck. I'll give you that. Thank you. And I'll give you this. I have the key ring because that's my own. Bye bye, room. Adam is now on trial leave from the hospital. 
In the event of an incident, he could be recalled at any time. This has been the first, and quite possibly the last chance to see inside Broadmoor Hospital in its current form. The lives of today's patients will continue nearby, where a new hospital is under construction. These old Victorian buildings have witnessed the troubled lives of so many over Broadmoor's 150-year history. Now, there's talk of turning them into a hotel. Thank <laughs> you.